All right, that is going to conclude the evil teaching. Some of you were booing because you wanted more. Okay. Don't worry, I'm sure I can bring more suffering later. Okay, so. All right, so this is what we call the afterburn. So this is when we have a chance for you to share thoughts, questions, comments, etc. get some answers to your questions about today's teaching. And so we did cover a lot. You can ask questions about this or any other part of the evil teaching, if I can remember the, the things I said over the last 19 weeks before this. But um, hopefully this is making some sense. It was a good teaching because you're going to need this perspective when we do the, t- the teaching on sin. Because sin is also going to have to do with the observer. It is subjective. Now, it's not subjective meaning something is either right or wrong in terms of Yahweh says that if you're in covenant, this is sin, it will always be sin. But it's relational. When you do something in a certain relationship, it's called sin. When you do it outside the relationship, it's called something else. Okay? So it's a labeling problem. And we just have to understand that. That's going to be tough for some of you, but this evil teaching hopefully helped you to at least have a perspective on how we can look at these things, okay? I mean, I'm not going to diminish the awfulness that sin is. I'm just going to put it in the right perspective on, on when that word should be used and what it is describing. Does that make sense? Is that fair? A little preview, okay, for the next, next teaching we end up doing. I may do that set apart one in the middle, though. All right, Janet. I hope I understand the teaching. I need to go back all the 20 parts. But I have, I just need to know one question only. Is that what you want? Yes? Yeah, okay. just one. Okay. We'll just do okay. one at a time. So, um, so I understand what you're saying about, you know, how evil, you know, there is always a good purpose, like we should embrace evil in our lives with Emunah, knowing that he causes or allows us and but I guess my question is, so that helps all of us, I guess, in the walk, to walk through those valleys of the shadow of death. But what happens when it's somebody who is not in covenant, who is going through evil, you know, like you know, pain, suffering, all that stuff, and they don't have that understanding or relationship and they're not in covenant? So I guess my question is, how would it, what would you recommend to tell someone or reframe that with, like in my case, I see a lot of clients who are not, you know, having this understanding. So how will you help somebody who, who is in that All situation? right, so let's understand that evil, okay, is an experience. And anybody can experience evil, whether they're in covenant or not, or anybody in any religious belief, or no, maybe no beliefs, maybe atheist or agnostic. It doesn't matter. Anybody can experience suffering, pain, ruin, harm, etc. The difference is the functionality and causality. So when you're talking about, Janet, people not in covenant, people that are just clients of yours that are coming to you with their uh, you know, uh, emotional and, and, and psych- psychological problems and other issues and they're suffering in their lives, there's still cause, all right? There's always causality to everything. So there's a cause to it. The thing is, in your life, the cause may, because you're covenanted, be something that Yahweh caused or allowed with a purpose to bring you around in a more of a teshuvah back in line with him about something. Whereas for them, who are not covenanted, not bubble popped, it's simply one of those, they did something or other people are doing something that they've had that just happens to cause harm. Okay, so what you can help them with is to figure out, first of all, is this something that we can dig down and figure out that you did to bring this about? And if it is, then you can stop doing that. It'll stop bringing it about. Which essentially is the same thing if you're bubble popped because if Yahweh's causing it or allowing it, he wants you to see you did this, which is why this is happening in your life, so you need to fix that. So it works either way, okay? Whether they're in covenant or not, Time and, uh, time and chance happens to everyone, but so that, that may be one of those things also that you deal with a client and say, look, the same thing with bubble pop people, sometimes it's nobody's fault, it's just time and chance. You live in a terrible world. Stuff happens. And so you want to dig down and see, is there a cause, an effect thing that's happening here, or is it simply just a time and chance thing that happened? Because if it's a time and chance, you maybe can get them to let go of some of the depression, anxiety, and, and other negative emotions linked to the event. Or if there is a causality there that you can identify, you can have them make adjustments so they're no longer bringing that result that they don't want. Okay? Did that help? 
All right, good. Okay, so, so for all of us, it works the same whether you're in the body or not. Okay, you do certain things. Okay, Yahweh's not mocked, you reap what you sow. Only difference is that once your bubble is popped, he has an invested interest in you ending up in the kingdom at, from that point forward and will either cause or allow you to go through things with the understanding that it will help nudge you along in that direction. Those that are not bubble popped, who he's not working with yet, that's the important piece, right? Yet, they still will have suffering in their lives and it still may have a cause they can point a finger at and realize they need to change in their lives, okay? I mean, I've had people tell me about their horrible relationship with their daughter or their son or whatever, and then I can understand when they're telling me how horrible their daughter or son acted, but I, I want to first also understand, well, what did you do? What do you mean, what did I do? I said, well, there's a reason why your child is treating you this way too. It's not just them. Some of it's probably you. What are you doing? Maybe we can fix that. It'll fix the other part. Oh, no, no, it's just my terrible kid. Maybe, okay, probably not. Usually it takes two to tango, as they say, okay? And so it's not usually one-sided, all right? I had a couple sit with me one time literally about that kind of thing, and the, the wife was saying all of the stuff about the daughter, and I let it go for about a half an hour, and then she looked at me like, what do you think of that? And I said, I think that's the biggest bunk of junk, junk. I, mean, I said it was the biggest lie junk I ever heard. And I said that less politely, by the way. And the husband looked at me like, you can't talk to my wife like that. She's going to kill you. I wasn't worried. So, and she just stared at me. Like, I was like, and so she looked at me like, how could you say that? I said, because you didn't say one thing that you did. All you did was say what everything that the, that the daughter did. So, but what did you do? And then when we started unraveling it, we found out there was things that she did. Now, the daughter certainly owned part of it. I said, but there's a reason why, you know, like if you're a husband and wife and your kids talk to one of you and the kids don't talk to the other one of you, there's a reason, okay? Maybe a good reason or a bad reason, but there is a reason. If they don't treat you both the same, there's a reason because you're not treating them the same. That doesn't make, by the way, which one's right and which one's wrong. Maybe the kids are all mad at you because you're the one doing it right and they just don't like the discipline and the other one is the one that's just enabling and allowing them and they get so they get, you know, so it doesn't always say which is the better way to go, but it's, there's something different happening in how you're treating the child and the child's treating you differently, okay? So when you're dealing in the secular world, dig down to say, is there a causality here? Is there something we look at that's contributing to or causing this result? And if not, then let's just accept that it's random chance unless we see a pattern that can point to it otherwise. Okay, good. All right, Ashley. Shabbat Shalom, Rabbi. Shabbat Shalom. Um, first and foremost, I wanted to say thank you for this teaching. It's been beyond a blessing. Um, it's answered, and I think you'll know where I'm going with this, it's answered questions that I've had since I was four. So thank you. Good. Um, with that being said, um, one of the things, and I think you'll understand this, and I want to take this into counseling later if it's okay with you. What about intended evil from, I guess, myself and other entities for the future, um, is that where I need to um, just cling, cleave, and hold? You know what, I'm probably going to need a little bit more detail than that. So when we talk later, you just explain to me what you're talking about, okay? All right. I know it's hard sometimes you wanna try and get an answer to something, people will come up here, and they wanna not be that specific, but then sometimes I can't really deal with it unless it's more specific. All right, Steve? All right, I just had a quick comment. I wanted to point out that the problem is, is we can't change what's required, yet we all are looking to twist his word into our understanding instead of changing our understanding and accepting the fact that we can't change which Abba has said is required. Okay, Amen. Amen. Good point. All right, Chris? I had a comment and a question. Uh, the question was about Acts 15. So you're saying how they wanted to make sure that the Gentiles would, before they'd commit to the contract, they'd read it first, right? Um, how does that uh, match up with uh, Sinai when they were told, like, we, you're going to sign the covenant, basically, and then you get to hear what this, the covenant is, is part of, like what's in it. After. Okay, remember, at Sinai, this is the nation of Israel. 
they're not Gentiles, they know who Yahweh is. Yahweh just destroyed Egypt, pulled them out of Egypt, miraculously brought them to Sinai. So they already knew who they were dealing with. The Gentiles had no idea who they were dealing with yet. Okay, so um, I'm, we're thinking that the Gentiles would, I guess they wouldn't have those signs and wonders that, the, that Israel had, but, but maybe they'd they learn and that would, it would occur to them while they're uh, in the assemblies that they're going to and hearing Moses preached. So when they hear Moses preach, they're going, just like you, you pick up your Bible, you weren't there when Moses was doing his thing or anybody in the Bible was doing their thing, and you read it and you are inspired to believe that these things did happen and they tell you and teach you about your creator. And then when you get to the bread, it teaches you about the father and the son. So now you have two to understand and you either believe, which is where belief comes in, right, or you don't because you have no experience with any of this happening because you'd have not lived when it was happening. So Israel experienced all of those things and ended up at Sinai. And so he simply said, I want to make a covenant with you based on my relationship with you. Not based on what I'm offering you, but based on my relationship with you. Now when you get to Yeshua's day, okay, and we get to James and the, and the Jerusalem Council, the Gentiles are coming in because this all sounded interesting and exciting, but they, they needed to understand this is a covenantal relationship. And before you go ahead and get the sign of the covenant, which is circumcision, you might want to make sure you want the covenant first. Okay? So if I'm understanding that correctly, the Pharisees were kind of trying to get the Gentiles to go from Egypt all the way to Sinai without getting through that, the process of of what they needed to go through to get to that point where they could covenant? I guess that's one way to look at it. I mean, I don't think it's a perfect analogy, but the main thing is that they really, if you want to understand what they were really trying to do, they were trying to keep them out. Because yeah. they expected that that was going to be too big a leap for them to make, to go ahead and get circumcised first and then decide later if that's what they wanted, okay? And so they were using it as a way to bar entry. Yeah. Okay. Um, and my comment was in Zephaniah chapter 3 when you were talking about, for then I shall turn unto the peoples a clean lip. So in, in, at least in my, trans, uh, my uh, 2009, it says, or language is lip. So I was thinking like a clean language is kind of like a clean lexicon. And I want to thank you for the clean lexicon that I've been able to learn from you over the last 10 years because when I was reading my Bible when I was 12 or whatever, and I was... I guess just kind of, I guess Christianity, but just reading the Bible basically. I had none of the understanding of the words and it was a totally different book, so. I appreciate that. Yeah, no, again, the clean lip meaning again, so you're understanding things clean, without hypocrisy, without integrity issues, without confusion, and you're able to speak with that same way and with that, that straightforwardness. All right, Amy? Shabbat Shalom, Rabbi. Shabbat Shalom. Well, I like to have my thoughts put together, but I don't think I really do. It's just really a heartfelt thank you to you. Um, you know, I've been with MTOI for five and a half years now, and <clears throat> the, I'm here because of the way that you do teach us and the, the example that you give us to follow because that's what I was looking for and all the other places I went to and could never seem to find and never find answers to my questions and never find the truth. And that's really just what I wanted to hear. I like somebody that speaks straightforward and is not phony and has uh, no pretense about them. So <clears throat> I did want to say thank you. And as you were uh, bringing out these scriptures today and the writings from the apostles and stuff to show us that we're going through the same things today that they were warning about, about back in their time. I appreciate you uh, taking a stand and taking the time to um, show us what that looks like and, and what the things that we face here and now so we can make a decision, you know, make our own decision and, and weigh our options, if you will. And I was just thinking back through different things that I see you do time and time again. It's just, this is, to me, this is just who you are. You know, and for instance, at the feast, you know, not only are you our teacher, you're our leader, you put everything together, you have all this responsibility on your shoulders, but yet you found time to serve people their food. You always fill in when we need a drummer, and you have all these great other skills and 
and talents, you know, that are needed to fill in these holes, and you, and you always do it so gladly, you know, and I can, I, you know, I, it, you enjoy it. And it made me happy that you, you and Robinson could be serving people the food because that's how you were when I first met you, the first feast I came to in 2017. You know, Robinson was greeting people at the door. You always were taking time to talk to people and answer questions. And I was like, wow, I've never, you know, that's what I've been looking for. And, and, and that's who you are. And that's who Robinson is. And I think one of the, you know, people don't really understand unless they're here and experience them themselves and see it face to face. But even um, the last, I think it was the last counseling session I had, <clears throat> I had been struggling with something, but I didn't know what it was. And I went into counseling, not with you, because you weren't here. You went to go to dinner for something special. But I went in um, with Alter Billy and Shane and was asking them different questions I had. But then, lo and behold, you showed up in the midst of this because you didn't want to wait for your table. And you thought, well, maybe I'm going to, you said, I'm coming back. Maybe somebody needs me. And I just happened to be the person in there. And I and I did need you, but I wasn't, you know, I didn't know how to ask the question that was troubling me. It just came up as a side thing, and you told me exactly what I needed to hear. And, and I thought to myself, you know, maybe you guys should ask this too. What other teacher does that? Who says, oh, I don't want to wait 45 minutes or whatnot for my table. Let me go back and see if somebody needs help. <laughs> and I thought to myself, who does that? Only my <laughs> rabbi does that that I know of. So I'm so thankful to Yahweh that he brought me here. He allowed me to come here. And that you're such an example, at least to me, to change and to make myself change and do all the hard work that I said to Yahweh that I would do. And that, you know, that's one thing I said to him. If you just tell me what the truth is, I'll, I'll just do what you want, even if it's hard. And it is hard. A lot of it's hard. Amen. But I wanted to say thank you, Rabbi. Oh, I you're really very welcome. appreciate you. You're very welcome. Appreciate that. Uh, you know, I don't know even what to say. I'm just weird, okay? Um, we, we were supposed to go out to dinner, went to a place with a, when we got there, we, we weren't able to make reservations. It was a, they said it was going to be over an hour wait or something like that. And I said, I can't do that. Some of you that know me, I don't, I'm too ADD. I can't sit and wait. So I said, I'm going. And, so I, and I didn't go home, and I could have. I came right back to work because I only think about work. I just want to do whatever I can do all the time. And I'm not saying that to brag or anything. It's just, that's just where my head's at. You know, we've got um, this weekend coming up next week, not this weekend, but the next weekend, you know, you got Father's Day, and it's also my birthday, and people ask me what I want to do when I uh, work. I don't know. I just, I don't, <laughs> I don't think about doing anything. And so, which is very hard for my kids and my wife who want to do things for me, but I'm just, this just, he created me to just want to do this, you know? So, so naturally, I came back here to see if there was anything I could do here while I was. And then they called me about an hour later saying, OK, the table's ready. Do you want to come back? And I went back. But that way, I didn't have to sit there and wait. I was at least productive during that time. But I'm just you know, letting you know that that's not something that's supposed to be necessarily praiseworthy in me. It's, that's what he made me to do. OK? I'm just being congruent with that. All right? Now, by the way, that works great when it comes to serving you guys. It doesn't work so great socially, because I'd rather be doing these things instead of the social things. But it is what it is, OK? All right. Uh, Gerardo. Shabbat shalom, Rabbi. Shabbat shalom. Um, a few questions. A few questions. Um, would Stevie Yenu be wrong? Say it again? Would Stevie Yenu be wrong? I Moshe Yenu. Stevie Anu. Stevie that, Anu? Moshi Anu. <laughs> would that be wrong? <laughs> uh, Moshi Anu means like our Moshe or something. So, okay. So, so Massa wouldn't be wrong. So, Rabbi works. Rabbi's fine. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Um, my question is from like 1 Peter verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 8 through 22. Um, it's not necessarily a question, it's more of a short story and question in between. So, 
and we've been talking about this, I guess this sums it up for me. Um, overall, overall, don't worry too much as to what's going on. Be confident. You got it going on, and the only person that can actually slap you down is the actual rod. Don't question it if it doesn't need to be questioned. Okay, I mean, I can understand where you're coming with that. Look, if you are um, doing everything with all your strength, with all your might, the best you can, you should have every confidence that you'll end up where you're supposed to end up and it's all gonna work out. Okay, because somebody has told me, when I did that Are You Saved teaching, I was told by the person who hated the teaching and has tried to eviscerate me online about it, that it was the most depressing teaching he ever heard. And I was like, because you want that eternal security that the church gave you. But you have, and should have, because they're like, well, how do you know you're getting in? Because I said, you don't know until you get there. I said, because you should have every confidence that if you're doing what you're supposed to do, you'll get there. But I mean, look, let's face it, all right? Okay, I'll give you an example. You guys all know that I was trying to lose weight a while back. I haven't lost any since then, but I lost about 20 something pounds to begin with and then I hit this plateau. You know why I hit the plateau? Because I stopped doing the things that was continuing to make me lose weight. And so I, I'm not shocked when I get on the scale and see that I haven't lost any weight because I know what I've been doing. Just like if you take a test and you know you haven't studied and haven't done the homework, that you got an F or you fail the test. It shouldn't surprise you or if you get an A, it's because you know you did the work and you know you studied and you know you knew the subject. If you're doing the doing, you should have every confidence, which is what Gerardo was saying, you should have every confidence and ignore the stuff that's there to distract you from the path. Because those things are all to see if it can derail you from your laser focus moving forward. And don't be derailed, okay? Move forward. Okay, Connor, you wanna get up there real quick? I don't know if I... Uh... So first you wanna apologize for walking in late? Yes. Okay. Obviously. We had to watch <laughs> LB for a minute, so. Um... You said that our brothers are those that are like-minded, if I understood. The I brothers right being here. talked about in that verse, in okay. that section. Okay, could you define like-minded? Is that, every, or anybody that believes everything the same way we do, or is that somebody else who's following Yeshua Messiah? I'm gonna keep it right up by your mouth. Anybody that's following Yeshua Messiah as best as they can, is that like-minded, or could you kind of Okay, that? I think that there are those of us that are heading in similar directions, but like-minded means what it says, our minds are on the same page. We are thinking things the same, seeing things the same. And so, okay, let's, let, let, this is a really good lead into what I wanted to make a comment before going to live stream. If we go back to Yeshua's time, and let's say that James had a congregation, and somewhere down the road, Peter had a congregation, do you, do you understand that the congregations would be no problem for anybody to go back and forth because the teachers are on the same page, okay? So it wouldn't be about the people in the congregations, it would be about the teachers. So if any of the apostles had, an, had a congregation near another apostle's congregation, so to speak, they would be like-minded as their teachers are like-minded. And so what we have as a problem is, if you heard me addressing, is not the congregations, but the teachers. Okay, and the teachers are not like-minded. They're, they're actually, I don't even know what the word, I was gonna say open-minded, they're like wide-minded, I would say, instead of narrow-minded. And, and I don't mean narrow-minded in a bad way, like they don't have that laser focus. They try to open things up to be as welcoming to anybody and everybody. And it really needs to be welcoming, come as you are, but with the understanding we are going to be teaching the narrow. Okay? So it's kind of like a funnel. It's very wide at the opening. You can come in, but we're going to be teaching you so you go out the small end. Okay? You come in the, the wide opening, you're going out the small end. And so what happens is though, if, you op if the whole thing is just a giant tube, wide at both ends, that's not really accomplishing what we're talking about here, okay? And so, yes, it's come as you are, and we should be open to anybody and everybody coming, but the, the message should be the absolute, pure, unadulterated word is best that can be done, all right? Now, again, I like the question about when it says brothers, you know, who's the brothers? Well, the verse has to always be taken in context. Okay, like when Yeshua's talking about neighbor and he says, who's the neighbor? Then we have to say, what's the context of what's going on in the verse? 
Well, in this section, he's referring specifically to those who are in covenant. And that, that is the audience that he's talking to. And so we have to be careful who the audience is, right? And so then we get the context. All right, now, let's go to the live stream for the last couple of questions here. Okay, from Anna Uden, says, question, Psalms 23, 2. Can this also mean turning back from depression or other types of, quote, unquote, darkness? And comment, division is evil. Okay, well, 23.2 is to give you that scene of shalom, of peace, of tranquility, no stress, no anxiety, no fear, okay? Green pastures, sounds, seems like a very, when you see them, they're like very peaceful seeming, right? And then still waters that are not being disturbed by all kinds of things stirring it up. And it's just to give you that sense of shalom, okay? And so because you have that, then you have no fear of evil, because you are maintaining this place of shalom no matter what's happening around you. Okay, next. Okay, from Gary, it says, uh, Rabbi, in Psalms 23, the reference of the rod and the staff, are they representative of Torah? And is that why Torah comforts us when we follow it? Um, indirectly. It's representative of the giver of the Torah. Okay, it's about the authority that gave you the instructions that bring you the, give you the comfort, okay? Remember, it starts off with Yahweh is my shepherd. So this is his rod, his staff, and he gives us the Torah, but that's part of his way of using the rod and staff to correct us and, and kind of hedge us in to the straight and narrow. So that's why I say indirectly, okay? But mostly it's really referring to our recognition of the shepherd's authority. Okay. Okay. Uh, here's another rod and staff question. It says, from Zepp, says, the rod and staff comforted me. How does a rod comfort? Is, isn't the rod for chastisement? You know, they have done studies that show that children that are not disciplined and chastised are very much lack shalom and comfort. In other words, they need something to boundary them in. And usually that's the rod that smacks them and say, no, you can't go there. And no, don't do that. And they're comforted knowing that there's boundaries. And so the rod and staff are things that are used to implement and impose boundaries. Children need to know where the boundaries are. And so yes, the rod can be used as chastisement, but again, the, the key is that it's for boundaries. It's to give you a little tap and say, no, don't go over there. Ah, no, don't do that. Okay, next. Okay, from Yanni, she said that this was an inside joke, but it says, Rabbi, this is just a yes or no question. Isn't there more evil in Revelation? That's funny. Okay. <laughs> we, we were talking in zone two today, and Yanni was trying to get me to do some eschatology, and it was just, it was one of those things, so... Anyway, go ahead. And she said just a yes or no question, but it was, a, it was an eschatology question. So it was just referring to zone two. All right, go ahead, next oh, question. Okay. John Reich uh, from Kayla says, how do vertical structure and submission fit into the larger body coming together in agreement or when there are areas of disagreement? All right, this is a really good question. Once upon a time, I had a thought and tried to get others excited about the thought of this idea of working together to serve the body and reached out to a lot of quote unquote leaders of congregations and teachers about the idea of having some sort of an organized gathering to try to figure out if there is, if it's possible to work together. Of course, working together requires being like-minded, at least in very large ways, all right? Now there was a very positive response to it in theory with very little positive response to actually do anything, okay? And that's where I felt like the Ruach grabbed a hold of me and said, if you build it, they will come type of thing, okay? Of course, in the movie, it's if you build it, he will come. But if you build it, they will come. In other words, build something that's organized and structured like that and maybe others will join in. So then we formed MTOI. This is in 2013. 
All right. Now, it was in 2012 or 2011 that I had conversations with people about the idea. You know, some of them were traveling teachers, big name teachers. Some of them were leaders of congregations. And they all kind of, kind of gave a little positive nod to the idea. But nobody really was interested in putting in the effort. My idea was to have a conference just for leaders to spend a couple of days breaking bread, getting to know each other, and trying to see if we can find like-mindedness and work together. Now, so it never bore any fruit. So then we ended up with the MTOI. And in MTOI, when we have our leadership meetings, we have only congregations and extensions of MTOI, which are congregations, that are like-minded. And we've actually invited and had others come from time to time, and some have left, because we were not like-minded. And they weren't thrown out, they just decided to leave. We've not thrown anybody out of the leadership, okay? And so people have, over the years, made some choices like that based on this idea of coming into agreement. Now, the interesting thing was, and I've told this story many times, in 2010 or 11, whatever it was, I went to a conference that was supposed to be a leaders conference. I had spoken to the lady that was organizing it before she actually put it all together and recommended that we basically try what I was talking about at the conference. In other words, get these leaders together, let's see if we can talk about what we agree, disagree, and can we work together and that kind of thing. And so when I got there, it didn't end up going that way. There was probably... 20 or so leaders there. It was a small conference. It was in Springfield, uh, Springfield, Missouri. And only two or three people, if I named them, you would know. There were other, mostly other was just local leaders and stuff from that area that you wouldn't know. And it just didn't go that way. Um, one of the bigger name, biggest named person there got up and spoke, and then everybody else who pretty much came out of his ministry basically got up there one at a time just saying how great he was and derailed the whole thing. It missed the point of the conference. And so I went last, and each one who got up there before I went, that just randomly they, drew, you know, they just drew us out of a hat, I just got to go last. It worked out perfectly. They each got up there and basically said that, you know, if we could all just agree on the majors and stop fighting over the minors, everything would be great. So I got up and I said, I, I, you guys have wasted my time for two days. I said, because not a single one of you said anything worth anything because nobody was willing to mention one thing that was a major or a minor. And I promise you, if you actually mention them, whatever you thought was a major, this one would think was a minor, and this one thought was a minor, this one would think was a major. So you don't, won't even agree on that. But we didn't get to do that because all of you wasted our time for two days. They weren't happy with me, okay? Because that's what happened, it was a waste of time. Because that's what they all say, that's the rhetoric, is that, you know, it waters down ultimately to almost, you might as well be Christian because all you have to do is believe that Messiah is Messiah. As long as we believe in Messiah, then aren't we all the same, aren't we all in, aren't we all saved, aren't we all whatever? Yeah, but if you believe in Messiah is very different than my Messiah, the way I see him, then we're not believing even in the same Messiah. If your Messiah is for Christmas and Easter and Sunday and the law is done away with and nailed to the cross and everything, my Messiah isn't. So we're not even believing in the same thing. So where do you draw the lines? And that's where I was hoping people could come together and we could work that out. So the answer to the question, how does the vertical structure and submission fit into this? It probably won't until Yeshua returns and institutes it himself. There will be pockets of it. MTOI is, in my opinion, a really valuable beta test of people trying to come together in alignment with each other, in like-mindedness, to try to accomplish something on behalf of the Father in serving people, right? It's just a beta test. And I don't mind if people take it and duplicate it or if they want to come and work with us. But the idea is, at least we have 20-something congregations and affiliating you know, people that are trying to work together, and we are all like-minded. And when we sit together on anything that needs to be a decision, we have a meeting about it, and in that meeting, a decision is made, and then we all abide by the decision. This is like the Jerusalem Council. This is like the Sanhedrin, okay, where there was leadership that would come together and a decision would be made. And so this is Deuteronomy 17 in action, okay? 
If you don't know what Deuteronomy 17 is, go back and read it. That's where if a problem comes up and you don't know what to do, you go to the leadership and the leadership makes a decision and you do what they say. Okay? And so we've made lots of decisions over the last almost 10 years. You know, it's, it's, it's going to be it's nine years plus on, on, since we started MTOI. Okay? I guess not quite. It's just we started in November. So it'll be, it'll be going on nine years here. And so... When it, so how does that fit into the bigger structure? It doesn't yet. It would be nice if it would. I think it'd be great if we could get the body's leadership to come together. Because like I said, you guys would like us to interact with other congregations in a way that if the leaders are not on the same page, cannot happen. Okay? Not cannot happen because of animosity and, 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 and that kind of thing, but just because it's hard to work together when you're on a different page. Look, two cannot walk together unless they agree. Okay, and if you're going to use Jesus, and I'm using Yeshua, and you're going to say, eh, it's no big deal if you eat pork or not, and I'm going to say it is a big deal. If you're going to say this, and I'm going to, then how are we walking in agreement? Okay? If you think one saved is always saved and I don't, if you think grace is unmerited favor and I don't, whatever it is, we can't walk together. We're on two different, or, or I should say the differences are too big. So how do we do that? Well, one of the things would be nice is if the leaders got together and argued and fought it out and actually saw what they could do to find some way to come to agreement. But the problem is most of them are still trying to keep the wide funnel. And so they think they need a wide funnel. This is proof you don't need such a wide funnel. Okay? People are moving here every month because they like hearing the straight just don't sugarcoat it, give me what it says, and not try to make it palatable. Okay? All right? If I want you to wear seat seat, I'm going to wear them where you see them. I'm not going to hide them and tuck them in, if, uh, then you'll never know if I'm wearing them. I'm going to lead by example. That's, uh, there's no other way to do this. But when you have some people in the body being told they can wear multicolored seat seat and whatever they want to wear, or they can, uh, or, or not have to wear them at all, or some say you have to wear white and blue, some have to say this, some, then how are we even remotely on the same page? We're not keeping the same calendar. We're not keeping the same days that way. We're not, there are groups, I was taught, hearing about groups today in the zone two, there are groups, Messianic, Torah, Pursuant, whatever groups, that after their service, they all go out to eat on Saturday. I wouldn't do that, so we're not on the same page. I wouldn't teach that, so we're not on the same page. How do, how do we work together when that, there's that much of a chasm between what's going on? And so you all wonder, well, this is not the right spirit. We should have this whole kumbaya get together. That, you know what? Every religion tries to do that. Go join one of them. You want all the kumbaya stuff? Go be Buddhist or be Hare Krishna or somebody where they just walk around loving everybody in whatever way that they do it, okay? We're trying to get our lives right in line with him, okay? And that means we do love each other but oh, we don't just love each other and just anything goes. And I see that in too many places. I mean, I went to a Messianic conference. This is in 2000, when did we go to that MIA one chain? 2010 or 11, something like that. Okay, I went to a conference in 2010 or 11. And that conference spent the whole conference apologizing to the church or, or for anything that we ever said that was against what the church system's doing. And I sat in the hallway because I couldn't sit in the main room and listen to that. So I ended up in the hallway talking to people instead because the whole thing was a praising of the, of, of the charismatic movement, a praising of the Pentecostal church, an elevating of every church father that ever had been in those movements. They ended up eventually bringing out a giant kiddish cup that was like eight feet tall and, and got wine out of it and everybody did communion. And this is supposed to be a messianic conference and they're doing communion. I said, what are you, you're praising the Pentecostals and you're doing Catholic things. 
It was bizarre. I don't know what else to say. People meet us and they meet all these different groups. They have no idea what we stand for. Or what we, you know, it'd be like trying to claim that, you know, a Catholic and a Pentecostal are the same, or a Baptist and a, and a Methodist are the same. They're so different, right? Oh, but we're the same. No, you're not. That's why you have different churches and you don't go to each other's churches and you have different beliefs because you don't see things the same. Well, guess what? The Messianic movement is no different. The Hebrew roots, whatever you want to call us, is no. See, I call us Torah Preserving Israel. We're Messianic Torah Preserving because that's what we are. We name our group because that's what we are. All right? We're not Hebrew roots. Okay? Christianity has pagan roots, not Hebrew roots. Okay? Because the Messianic has Jewish roots. All the original believers were Jews. Okay? Christians came out of the other stuff. And then they decided to come into Israel. So when they talk about the Hebrew Hebrew roots of our faith, you guys are dying the roots, that's the problem. (laughs) They're fake. Okay? And if you dye your roots, you know that stuff is toxic, it's gonna kill you anyway. I mean, this is important that we get this because we're going to be, and all of you need to know this, you're going to be receiving from people that have left here over the years, if not now, sometime in the future, requests for friendships, invites to dinners. There, you are going to be recruited if you haven't already. And I don't care, that's fine. This is a good sifting and filtering. I just sit back and watch and see what happens. But just you need to know you're going to be filtered. You're going to be tested. You're going to be invited. You're going to be recruited. Because people don't leave here and just leave. They leave here and want to bring you with them. Okay, so... I'm not talking about anything that just happened necessarily, although I am, because anytime there's a split of any sort, you will be recruited. People will reach out to you to try to bring you wherever they're going. And so, and people look at me like, and so don't come to me and tell me about all the people that are doing the recruiting. I don't care. If anybody goes, they were supposed to go. It's a filter. So don't, don't think you're gonna rile me up saying, well, you know, so-and-so is recruiting. Well, I expect them to. My, my curiosity is what are you gonna do with that recruiting? I wanna watch and see how you respond to it. Are you gonna go or you're not gonna go? You're gonna stay or you're not gonna stay? I don't really have a vested concern either way. I'm gonna teach whoever sits in front of me, okay? And so whether you stay or go is really not my, my weeds, so to speak. It's not my issue. I'd like you to stay, don't get me wrong, but that's between you, him, and whatever I'm doing is just to provide an opportunity. MTOI, Best Shalom, these are just opportunities to come and do something. And if this opportunity makes sense to you, then you're here. If it doesn't, then go somewhere else. But you need to know that I talk about this because it's getting more and more where you're not knowing what to do about it, so I'm getting issues with that when people come to me saying, what do I do? I've got friends now going to the other place over there or the other place over here, and you, that's part of your growing and testing. You need to figure it out. Don't come to me. What do you want me to tell you to do? Of course, I think what we're doing is the right thing, so you should be here. But if this doesn't work for you, then you need to be there. That may be part of your journey back to wherever you need to go. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. You need to understand why we can't work together, though, because two can't work together unless we agree. We do not agree. We can't walk together when we're not walking together. We're walking in this way. We're kind of walking in the same direction, but not really, okay? All right, look, if we were in the middle of the country somewhere, let's say somewhere like east, west, whatever, like sort of towards the east part of Texas or something, and so all the way that far south, and we both started walking north, but one of us was heading kind of northeast, the other one was kind of heading northwest, we're gonna end up eventually very far apart. But we're still walking north. Oh, we're walking in the same direction, sort of. We're not gonna end up in the same place. One of us is gonna end up much closer to, you know, the east coast, the other one's gonna end up on the west coast. 
depending on how much we're walking similar, we still may end up split off. You know, some, one of us may end up in Minnesota, the other one may end up in, in, on the other side in like uh, Michigan or something. So we're still, that's still far enough apart, even though we walk generally north. Okay? So what are you going to do? This, this, is, this is real life what we're dealing with right now. Okay, in real life, there's a lot of confusion out there. In real life, there's a lot of people thinking that they're teaching everything right, wanting you to believe they're teaching everything right. So do I. I mean, you know, we all think that. But you have the problem. I don't have the problem, and the other teachers don't have the problem. You do. You have to figure it out. You have the problem and the challenge of figuring out where to be, where to go, and who to listen to. Not my problem. It's not the other teacher's problems. It's yours which is why Paul tells you what he tells you in Ephesians 4. And there are people out there going, when is Rabbi going to stop this? I'm, you're, you're the ones dealing with this right now. And you need guidance to deal with this because it's only going to get more, not less. The more this, the true was coming out, look in the first century, the more duplications and imitations with mixing appeared. Look at the church, by the time you get just a few hundred years away from Yeshua, it doesn't look anything like they started. Although they claim the same beginning. And so, where does that leave us? You know, that's why we may have to do the set apart teaching. You have to see the verses that talk about, you know, beware, there are false teachers already. Those that are looking to confuse. Look at Paul got so mad at the Galatians because they had a few of those in infiltrate or, you know, come in contact with the congregation in, in, in uh, Galatia. And the Galatians were starting to go off and, and Paul's like, who taught you that? I didn't teach you that, he said. Where'd you get all that mess from? I went away for a little trip. I come back and you're all in this disaster over here. Where did you get that from? Well, you know, these people came in and they sounded real smart and they knew what they were talking about. He didn't say, hey, it's all good. We all believe in the same Messiah. Don't worry about it. He called them stupid. Because he thought it was stupid that they would drift away from what he had taught them. I know we beat that five-fold thing to death, but... I think Paul, that may be the most important thing he ever said. And I think it's no doubt in my mind the absolute truth. Abba has always planted men around on the world, on the planet, in the world, every, at, at all times, right? There was always some there doing those fivefold things that men needed for the perfecting of the, of the believers, of the body. And our job was to find them. And that's, that's like finding the needle in a haystack, though. Because there's so many more of the other ones than the ones that we're looking for. And you have to ask and seek and knock and go out and do all that. I mean, we're growing as fast, if not faster, than when we, before splits and things. So it's not, it's not like I care or I'm worried about any of that stuff. I'm worried for you guys. Because a lot of you will be adversely affected by the drama, at the very least. Some of you just don't like drama, you're gonna to wanna to run away because there's too much drama. Well, we're dealing with people, there's gonna be drama. I know that's horrible, but it is what it is. With people, there's drama. Read your scriptures, nothing but drama. All the time. Okay? And you don't like that. Well, I don't like division. I don't like conflict. I don't like, so what are you going to do? You're going to water it all down so that everybody's happy? Then nobody's happy. Okay, you can't do that. And I don't know, I really don't understand some people I know fairly well who are now sitting other places. I don't know how they sit there and listen to what they're listening to. Knowing what they claimed their beliefs were before. I don't understand how they can do that. And yet they're there. And I sit there going, really? With the person's name after it? Really, so-and-so? Really? <laughs> That's okay with you? What you're... Not the you I knew before you went over there. 
But this is where, again, chasing feelings ends up. If you're chasing a feeling, you're gonna end up in places like that because that's where you're gonna get your feelings met. They're gonna provide you what you wanna feel. You know the feeling I wanna have? The confidence that I did the right thing. I wanna feel right and confident. I don't wanna feel warm and fuzzy. I mean, if I, if I do get that too, that's great. Don't get me wrong. But I'm just saying is, I'm not chasing a feeling. I'm chasing an integrity. I'm chasing a congruence vertically. I'm chasing two walking together, me with them. Okay? That's what you should be chasing after. Anyway, I'm sorry. I just took all the, all the time from you guys. Rob? That's awesome, Rabbi. Um, I guess all of this, when you, this from me today, you know, when you went into Zephaniah talking about doing the violence in Torah and then, you know, referencing, and then you went into Psalm, and I had a little side note that I written in there, and it, you know, it said go back to Jeremiah 23, and 23 verses 1 through 4, I think, would this not be exactly, would this not be going on today? Is there scat? There are shepherds that are out there scattering. Yeah, and he's trying to bring them in. Verse four, you know, yeah. and he's and that just proves the word true of what you've been saying that you need a teacher because there's a shepherd there that that has to be. He's going to bring up a shepherd to feed you, you know, to to what you're doing right now. So it just reaffirms why I'm here, Rabbi, and that appreciate I'm here it. for you. So. I appreciate that. And listen, listen, I, I, I want to address the other half of Anna's question that I really didn't address. When, when you, she asked about the vertical structure and submission. Here's the thing, okay? All submission is voluntary. All right? Otherwise, it's not submission. It's slavery. It's some other imposed thing, oppression. Okay, submission is voluntary. So you're not going to see anything going on in, the, in an organized way, in a big way to fix all these problems, unless there are leaders willing to submit under one leader, okay? In other words, that's the way it always has to work. There has to be those coming together with the agreement that somebody gets to make a decision after hearing all of the discussions and everything else. That's what James did in Acts 15, okay? And notice that once he made a decision, there was no more arguing or discussing. And they were having a pretty heated debate up to that point. And he said, okay. I've heard what you guys have to say. Here's what we're going to do. And that's what I do with the MTOI meetings. I say, okay, I've heard what everybody said. This is what we're going to do. Now, but that's because the people in the, in the MTOI leadership have voluntarily submitted and come and agreed that they trust that I have that position from on high, not just because I'm some random guy, that I'm supposed to be that guy in this group. So, when you see this other mess going on out there, it's because there's nobody to make them stop. Which is why I say it probably doesn't get addressed until Yeshua shows up with his rod of iron and says, okay guys, knock it off. It's time to stop. There's one leader, one head. That's what Ezekiel 37 was saying. They will appoint themselves one head, one leader, and they will follow under, and it will be the one like David HaMelech, King David. Because until then, if we had a leadership thing, you know what the first thing that's gonna happen is? Well, who gets to make the decisions? Every time I counsel a new congregation forming, like people might call me because they're forming a congregation, they're not yet part of MTY, but they're, they got things going on, or they already have a congregation of some sort of assembly or fellowship, and I, I always ask the same question first. Who makes decisions? How are decisions made in your group? Because it's really important to know who actually is leading this thing. Because the person may claim they're the leader, but they don't actually get to make the decisions. They're not the leader. And so I always want to know how decisions are made. And if you're an extension of MTOI, which means that you're administering a congregation under my authority, that you're not actually the teacher or the leader from that point of view, but you're, you're having a home fellowship or a group that's using the live stream, for example, or whatever, then it's very important that when new people come in, you let them know how decisions are made so that they don't assume there's a vacuum and want to jump in and impose their way of making decisions. Because that always happens. 
And so that's where, for example, when Gary was leading, Shamash Gary was leading the group in Urbana. You know, new people would come in and he'd have to say, we are in MTOI, we are an extension of MTOI, and rabbi is our rabbi and he makes the decisions. Okay, because we had a small home fellowship group that was meeting up in Canada. And a person came in and said, hey, that's great. I know we're watching rabbi's teachings. How about next week we watch this other guy's teachings? And the leader had to say, this is not that. This is what it is, and this is what we offer. And if this works for you, great. If it doesn't, then you need to go somewhere else, and that's fine. But you, it's all about who and how decisions are being made, who's making them and how they're being made. You know? And I've seen the frustrating side of this. I mean, I, we were renting from a Baptist church in, in uh, the next town over years ago, and I used to meet with the pastor, and he was a frustrated camper boy because he had no power at all. Because if you're the Baptist pastor, the deacons run everything. He had no authority and he was so frustrated. And he couldn't vent to them, so he vented to me. So I was actually like counseling him. <laughs> and I said to him, I said, that's why we don't do it this way. I don't, I don't have anybody pulling my strings or doing anything without me authorizing it. He said the last straw for him was one day he got to services and during the announcements, one of the deacons stood up and announced a brand new program that was starting that following Wednesday or Thursday that he didn't even know about. And I looked at him, I said, why are you doing this? Why are you letting this happen? You're a hireling. He didn't like that. Not he, was, he wasn't mad at me, he didn't like that he knew it was true. I said, you're not leading anything. You're a hireling. They're paying you to try to bring more people to the, to the altar call, and that's it. And they actually got mad at him when his altar call numbers were down. I said, you're a hireling. I lead a congregation. I'm not a hireling. Okay? And that's why people, when they come into MTOI and the leadership, they understand. I will make all decisions. That's not a cockiness or this or that. It's my job to do it. It's my responsibility to do it. It's also my responsibility to hear everybody, let them have their say, take in their counsel, prayerfully consider all things, and then make the decision. But the burden, that's really the way to look at it, is mine. Right or wrong, I'm going to be held accountable for all of that. That burden is on me. The question is, can you or any other leader, see that's where we've had people come in. Recently we had another group come in and then they left. Why? Because the leader could not really fully submit that way. Wasn't really ready to do that. Not that we had any submission real conflicts, but just realized I need to do what I need to do. This is a challenge. You see this with Korach and others. You know, can you truly just accept and come under authority? And so there was another ministry once upon a time that I was very close with the leader and we were talking about working together and I said, look, you have a ministry and I have a ministry. If we're gonna work together, it's not gonna work like that. It can't work like that. You, one of, I said, so I said to him, because it was his idea for us to work together, I said, in your mind, who's under who? He said, no, I guess I would, so he, he, he understood, like who would be discipling who? I said, so we're clear. And he said it would be me, and that's fine, that I, would be on, that I would be the one over. I said, but then if we're gonna do this, that means that I have authority over your ministry on, on a certain level. And he wasn't ready to do that. Which I understand completely. And that's why when you wonder why can't this really work in a bigger way, because those things are pride. They're uh, not in a bad way necessarily, because it's my thing, I built it, I got it to this point, and I don't want to give you authority over it. but yet you're only gonna go as far as you're gonna go without coming under authority anyway. And so when you, I just wanna help answer some questions you all have about why can't we all just work together and this and that? Because we can't. We can't until we can come under a structure and in that structure somebody will have to be at the top of the structure, whoever that is, okay? This is a vertical structure, a king is coming. And we're practicing for that vertical structure now. Okay, so there's no other way around it. 
okay? And so then we look at the way the body is now. Well, look, we had somebody come to me, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago almost, complaining about a person, I won't mention who it is, who thought the book of Hebrews shouldn't be in the Bible. So maybe you know who I'm talking about. And his ministry still believes that. And so someone said to me, well, why can't somebody make him stop that? Because he's not under my authority. He's not under anybody's authority. He's got his own ministry. So nobody can make him stop that. Well, Yeshua could, the Father could, but he said, but there's nobody here on earth to make him stop unless he comes under authority and then the authority says to him, you need to stop. But he wasn't about to do that. That's 20 years ago. He still isn't doing that. Okay? Even though he's mostly retired at this point. But that's the point I'm trying to make here. The more this grows to whatever degree, the more there's going to be things to tempt you and that look sort of like it that you might go to. Hasatan's whole thing is imitation, duplication, and then twisting. Right? Imitate it, duplicate it, twist it. But in twisting it, he makes it more palatable to you. So you like the twists because it's much more palatable to you. It appeals to you. So it's not twisted like we look at it and goes, ooh, that's a twisted thing, you know? It looks, oh, wow, that's much better. That little spin on this works really much better for me. And so then you're tempted to go there because after all, it's more appealing. To what? What is it more appealing to? The emotions. It feels better, right? It, there's a feeling about it that you like. Anyway, all right, it's 5.30. So do we get the children? Go ahead and get the children. I'll try to answer like one more question while you're getting the children. All right, Rob, you got anything else while we're waiting for the children to come down? Um, yeah, yeah, we got a few more. So from Cindy Taylor, from Danny, says uh, Psalm 23.5, you have anointed my head with oil. What does that mean or signify? Okay, remember this, in this case, we're talking about David writing this. So David is talking about that he was anointed as king. Okay, this is actually David talking. So this is literal. Okay, David was literally anointed with oil. Okay? Okay, uh, Helen Thrasher, do we need to be conscious of what we say when it comes to evil, thought, or speech? Yeah, I mean, you need to understand that when you say things, when you think things, it can bring about harm, ruin, suffering, or something like that. You should be more conscious of those things, okay? By the way, you can have a lot of problems just with your thoughts. And the person that's gonna be hurting a lot of times is you. The things you say to yourself and think about yourself can cause you more harm and ruin than almost anything anybody else can say to you. Often, okay? So be aware of that. Also, outside, if you have thoughts that are the type that, are, that could cause suffering to other people, the more you think about it, the more they're gonna take action that's gonna bring the suffering. It's gonna bring the harm in some way. So yes, please, we do need to be conscious of what we say, and when it comes to evil thought or speech, okay, definitely be more conscious about what you're saying and what you're thinking and what you're doing. Terry Zimmerman, or from Raina, with regards to 1 Peter 3, verse 16, what would an evil conscience look like? Now knowing the definition of evil, is it to do with intent? Is it is it to do with intent, or is it us? Is it sorry? Is it us still being self-sovereign, not recognizing that? Okay, so First Peter three sixteen. What would an evil conscience look like? Okay, so here it's talking about having a good conscience, so that when they speak against you as doers of evil, those who falsely accuse your good behavior, and Messiah shall be ashamed. Okay, so. A, a good conscience is being talked about here, not an evil conscience, but having, having a good conscience. So what's, what's an evil conscience? Okay, one that is suffering, one that is in pain, one that is, um, I guess that's really all I want to say there, suffering and pain. But if you have a good conscience, it means you're confident, you're at peace, you, you, you're, you, you're, you're owning what your choices and decisions are. So having that good conscience, so that when, that in other words, in this description of 1 Peter 3, 
there's an accusation happening. And you say, but I know I'm right. I know I did the right thing. I know what I'm doing is right. So when they speak evil of me, I'm not going to let that bother me at all. Because I have a good conscience. My conscience is in line with his. My conscience is that I know that I've done everything I need to do to be right in his eyes. So what's an evil conscience? One that's not doing that at all. One that's just going around and being uh, affected by every wind of everything and you know, susceptible to the negative influences of other people and all that stuff. And, and you don't have any confidence. Having a good conscience so that when they speak against you as doers of evil, those who falsely accuse your good behavior, so you're doing what's Torah and you're being accused that that's evil. Anybody get that from your Christian friends when you started walking this out? Saying your switch you know, to Saturday and you're giving up Christmas and Easter and all those other things was evil? Was gonna, you were gonna go burn in hell and blah, 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 whatever they threatened you with? But if you have a good conscience, your conscience is vertically aligned correctly, you would be at peace that no, I made the right choices for the right reasons. All right, what else? From Betty Cardin says, is it, true sta- is it a true statement to say evil is delivered by another human being, whether perceived or intended? Look, it's a true statement to say evil is, is delivered if, if you perceive that. In other words, it's a subjective thing. Okay, I may be observing the same thing happening as you are. I may think it's not evil, you may think it's evil, or vice versa. It's totally subjective. We've been told completely wrong that this evil thing was this very objective thing. It's not objective, it's subjective. There are people that think that stuff that's happening to me right now would be evil as they're watching it, and I don't think it is evil because I think that it's actually serving a good purpose and it doesn't bother me at all. In other words, people might look at when people split, well, that's evil because it's causing suffering and harm. Yes, it does, but I think it's actually good because it's actually a filter to help filter out people that need to go somewhere else until they do whatever journey they need to do somewhere else. Okay? I didn't say filter out the wrong and the bad and the evil people. I said filter people out who just need to be somewhere else to finish their journey, whatever they're doing. And so I think it serves a good purpose. So is there suffering? Yes. So from that point, I would see some of these things as evil. People suffer when these things happen. But on the other side of it, I also see it as good because I think it serves a good purpose ultimately. So again, if you can't see through my eyes, you might not see that part. All you see is the suffering. Okay, and then you get mad at me because I allowed it to happen or caused it to happen, and you don't like the fact that they're suffering. And yet there has to be. It does, does it bother anybody when you read Revelation? Did it bother you that Hasatan gets released? He doesn't escape. Yahweh releases him and unleashes him on the world at the end of the millennium. Could there be anything more evil than that? I didn't mean from literally causing ruin, harm, suffering, and pain and destruction. What could be more evil than unleashing Hasatan on the world after he was chained up? But it's a necessary evil because it's a filter, it's a test. And you have to go through the Deuteronomy 8 2 test, you have to be tested. And so it's necessary, unfortunately, to go and and experience that because you need to overcome the evil with good. We read that today, okay? And not be overcome by the evil. Certainly not join forces with it, which is what a lot of people end up doing in the end of the millennium. They end up joining forces with it because it presents itself as the answer, not the problem. Remember, Hasatan would appear as an angel of light. His, his, his uh, demons as angels of light. Him as, as Yeshua himself. You would think that it was God himself if you saw Hasatan show up. You'd be so impressed. Of course, he tried to convince us through the media and all of the, th- you know, the ways of publications throughout the centuries of this devil with the horns and the tail and this scary monster looking guy. Scripture doesn't ever describe him that way. Scripture describes him as, you would think it was Messiah himself. You would think it was the most brilliant, amazing thing you've ever seen if you saw him. And you would be impressed. Some of you have come from that world and you know what I'm talking about. 
And you know that he appears and would be impressive. And that's part of why you were in that world, because you thought you were dealing with the right one because he was so impressive. Only to find out you were lied to. And praise Yah, you were drawn out of it and delivered from it. Okay? Because there are a few people in the audience, you know, in the congregation doing this, because they know, they've literally been there. See, a lot of us have never experienced that, so you have no idea. You have no idea what you're dealing with. You have no idea what you're playing with. You have no idea how easy it would be to tempt you and to fool you because of how impressive he really is. Because he is the greatest thing ever created. That's what it says in scripture. The most brilliant, most beautiful, most shining, most anything you can think of, which is why the ego, the pride, and all the other stuff got in there to make him crazy. Because you just don't think, well, God wouldn't do that. Read Revelation. He releases Hasatan on the world after he was chained up. That bothered me for a lot of years as to why would he release him until I realized, because everybody that was in the millennium needed to go through the Satan test, the adversary test. You can't really know where someone's at until they get tested on that level. Yahweh is not giving people forever suits until they're tested. Okay? And so all these people lived for almost a whole thousand years without that. Well, that was a whole lot easier, right? That was a lot simpler without him around. And that's why all these, I guess, complacent, spoiled people that lived through the millennium who think they got it so easy, they had it, well, we'll see what you're really made out of. We're going to have Hasatan show up. Then we'll know what you're really made out of. Well, guess what? If this is the truth, if, okay, don't you think Hasatan's gonna put duplications and imitations and twistings all around us to tempt you? Doesn't that make logical sense? Oh, but that's just, that's just a hard, how could you speak of other congregations that way? I don't know, I just did. Wasn't hard at all. Because I'm just looking at the leadership and the teaching, okay? And the examples that are being set. And I see them as watering down, twisting, and enabling people to break and not be congruent vertically. That's my observation. And if that's mean-spirited in your mind and everything else, I'm sorry, okay? I feel bad for all the people that think they're in the right place when they're not. It feels right to them. It's, it passes the smell test for them. It has all of the little elements that they want. If you were trained right and taught right, you'd walk in and you'd walk right out because you know it would not pass the smell test. Okay, you'd walk in there and go, this is not right. Some of you have turned on the live streams or the recordings and you've looked at it and going, no. But then you wonder how other people don't. In other words, don't say no, they just, they just go. I'm not talking people that weren't here. I mean, people that had this first. I don't know how you go from this to that. After beware false prophets, how do you go to that? Okay. I don't know how you could do that. Maybe you didn't understand my teaching and you're gonna fall for the setup. Maybe you think I was wrong. We'll see, it'll play out and we'll know. I think the more that I see, the more I'm convinced I'm right, okay? Because every time you see the J name brought in, it's a watered down version of the truth, every time, okay? Even if it's Messianic and Saturday and feasts and whatever, there's stuff about it that is watered down and twisted and wrong when that name is brought in. Without exception, okay? And that's why we do not use the name, okay? I might use it when I'm explaining what other people are doing, but I'm never using it trying to convince you that Yeshua and that other name is the same, okay? And when they start to use them interchangeably, that should be like warning, warning, warning. Okay, Will Robinson. <laughs> so 
Some of you are thinking, he didn't do the Will Robinson thing. Warning, warning. Some of you are not old enough for Lost in Space. Okay. All right. Okay, all the children are in here now. We're good.